All right, let's begin. Let's begin year 12s. Wide down. All right, what we're going to do today is the last exercise of chapter 9. So, just before I go into the last exercise, let's recap the things you're meant to know for chapter 9. Yeah, remember they're all techniques. You haven't yet applied your knowledge yet. It's all about applying what you understand. So let's recap the things that you've learned. Ben. Let me one thing you have learned so far in chapter 9. Trent, give me one thing. Um, Matt is hard. That's a good start. Daja? Matt is very hard. Anna? I just wanted to know. Name. I wanted you to name chapter 9. What did you learn? I just want to go through the skills. Yep, give me one rule. Okay, good. We've got the product rule. What was the product rule? Can I please have Marzen? Yeah, what's the product rule again? Talk a lot about uh, Victoria University. Good. That's what I want you to remember because it's going to be in your exam one. I know it's going to be in question one. It could be that one or it could be another technique. What's the other technique, Basil? If it's not product, it could be question rule. What is the question rule? Can I please have Michael? What's the question rule again? There's a reason why I got you to remember Victoria University first. What's the question rule again? If that's product rule, question rule is? Good, you're just missing something now. Fantastic. So, I told you, it's either product rule, question rule, I told you to remember Victoria University first for product because it helps you remember quotient, yeah? The other difference between the two is one plus and one minus. Often you find that product rule, the ones written in your textbook, it's the other way around. Um, that's why I wanted you to remember Victoria University first so you don't confuse the two when you have division, quotient, when you have times, product. Trent? Yep, it must be. That's why it matters. Whereas in product rule, product rule doesn't matter, you see. So it doesn't matter which way you add it, it doesn't matter which one you call U or B because times and add is, they call it a commutative. So that means 3 plus 2 is 5, or you can do it the other way, 2 plus 3 is also 5, it doesn't matter. But subtraction does matter. So if you said 3 minus 2 which is 1, but you switch it around, you say 2 minus 3, it's not 1 anymore, it, it is negative 1. That's why when it comes to division, quotient rule is very specific. That u is the numerator, v is the denominator, it has to be correct. And that's why, I think that's why in the last two years, 2016, 2017, they purposely put quotient rule. Product rule was in your 14, 15. If you go back a bit further, about 2010, 2011, 12, that was chain rule. Yeah, so those are your three main ones in the last five, six years. Learn those three rules. It's either product rule, quotient rule, or chain rule. Now, what was the chain rule again? Can I please have... Let's go to Richie. What's the chain rule? dy over du. Times du over dx is equal to what? Good. It's one of those three. Now, remember, when Anna just said, these are just techniques to find the derivative, there's also another one. What are we missing? What's the other one, Aaron? We have product, quotient, chain, we're missing one more. Power rule, fantastic. We have the power rule, which only works for only variables, so one variable with a power, n. So let's say y equals ax to the power of n. Then the derivative dy dx so with respect to x is equal to what, Verity? Fantastic. Okay, whoops. Oh. oh, no. I was going to get you guys to do that, but don't worry about that for now. So, power rule, chain rule, product rule, quotient rule 
is all, they're, all, they're all techniques for you to find the derivative or differentiate your functions. You can get different types of functions. Now along with that, you also learnt in the last session how to find derivatives of extra functions. Now you learnt how to find derivatives of exponential, log, sine, cos, and tan. Which again, all of those was exercise 9g, 9h, 9i. All that is using chain rules to do it. Hence why I said chain rules your bread and butter because in your exam, it's likely to be one of those. It's either going to be find the derivative, so differentiate or derivative of exponential. So you got e to the x, sine of x, cos of x, log e of x, and you also have tan of x. So you need to know how to find the derivative of each one of those. So you've got to remember the rules for 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And then you also need to know how to use chain rule with all that. That's what 9, G, H, and I was about. Yeah? That's all the rules, but remember, after you learn all this, technically most of chapter 9 was to find out the derivative. And you, what you realize is you haven't applied anything yet. All I've taught you is how to find the derivative. But don't forget, there's only one thing you need to understand. When you find the derivative, what are you finding? The gradient of what? Of one point, which is the tangent line. Remember, gradient means steepness. So you're finding the steepness of one line. It's a tangent line, and you're finding how steep that is. That's all it is. All these techniques allows you to find, remember, a straight line, the tangent line is made up of y equals mx plus c. All of those techniques you just named with me is to allow you to find m. That's all it is. So you need a point. You only got one point. So at a point where you have x and y, the derivative tells you m. That's all it means. Okay, that's what the first principle is all about. But remember, you're not getting assessed with first principles anymore. You just need to understand theory. So now you understand theory. In chapter 10, they're going to allow you, to, or they're going to get you to find m. See, none of this so far has asked you to find the equation of the tangent line. But it was easy. We did that in the first session. Yeah? Find the hardest part is to find the derivative, the correct derivative. Find m. Once you find m, you can find c. That's easy. Okay? But the hardest part is understanding what this is. And you can see why if any of these skills here that you can't do, if you can't find the derivative of these in any form, then of course you can't answer the questions. Why you can't then find the gradient? Why then you can't find the graph, sketch a derivative graph? Why you can't then find the coordinates where tangent line has a gradient of 3? You know, all those questions are in your 910 of your exam 1. And that also leads to your extended response questions, which is why I'm saying it's 75% of what you need to know comes from that. Okay, so if you don't get it, you just got to work through it. If you don't get it, watch my videos and ask me. But you need to tick all of those skills there. They're all important for you to be able to sort of go through the questions. Okay. All right. Now, after knowing all that, there's a little bit um, on what you now need to know in terms of what it means by differentiability. Because they, if the examiners do give you a question, they'll get you to sketch the derivative graph. And when you sketch the derivative graph, which we did in 9D, which I'll re-upload there. There was a corrupted file there. Um, you need to be specific with your points, and your endpoints matter. And that's what this exercise is about. So if you remember that session I talked about. Uh, a graph, and I drew this kind of graph on the board. I went something like this and like that. It's a modulus graph. And I told you that you had a gradient here that's say that's negative 1, this point here is 1, and I said this was 1, and I said this is y and x, and I said if you were to find the derivative graph, and this is what we drew as a derivative graph, I'm going to do it in blue. We did the derivative graph and we said alright, well dy dx dy, dx, and x. We said that the gradient on the left-hand side is a positive gradient, and we worked out it's rise, I mean, run 1, rise 1. It's a positive gradient, so you said from the left-hand side it should have been positive 1. Then I said the derivative on the left-hand side, you can tell it's a negative gradient, and it's a negative gradient of, again, rise 1, and to the right by 1, so it's a negative gradient of negative 1. That's sketching the derivative, but the one thing you needed to make sure were the endpoints. What did I say in that class when I said the endpoints? How do you draw this properly? What did you need? Anna. An open circle. And I said not until you get to 9M, which we'll talk about why it's an open circle. Logically, the way I tried to describe it to you was that we knew at every single point on the curve, 
They all had a gradient. The tangent line at every point was always one. But this is positive one. The tangent line on these points were always negative one. So the question is, at the very top, at x equals zero, what's my tangent line? <coughs> is it zero? Is it positive one, negative one? What is it? Well, we don't know. The reason why we don't know, you can see, I know the answers for every x value. The only point that I don't know is that x equals zero looks like it could be one, or it looks like it could be negative one. So in both cases, I have no idea. It could be one or negative one, but because I don't know, it's undefined. Okay, but the technique I just did with you, going from the left and going from the right, and we're approaching a particular value, is what you're doing in exercise 9M. Okay, they're called limits, and what we're doing, we're sort of saying, what if I approach a certain value, what is it tending to? If they both approach the same value, we say that it exists. It must have a particular point. That's what 9L is about. Okay, so that's what today is all about. It's about knowing how to prove that point exists or not, and how is it relevant to your exam when they ask you to draw a derivative graph. They can give you a graph like that, and then say, sketch the derivative graph, and your end points, or any sharp points, matter the most. And, yeah, and sometimes they might say, prove a certain point is differentiable or not. Then you have to be able to describe it. That's what 9L and 9M is. Okay, so it's a small part. If you don't get it, you'll probably lose a mark or two, but the majority of the marks comes from that other slide I just showed you, so the previous slide. Oh, here you go again. Okay, all of those must be checked off. Okay, you're not doing yourself a favor. In chapter nine, you're looking at any of those right now and you're like, I don't know, I can't, I can't do it. You have to be able to say, you can do it. Okay, chapter one, chapter nine, they put together already, you can probably pick up checkpoints and you should be able to do some of the questions there. Okay, because that, that's how easy it is to do the end of year exam. That's what you need. Okay, all right, so let's have a look at limits now. Now limits, we had a brief look at um, what limits mean. And limits just basically mean you're approaching a value and there's ways that we write it. So if you just have a look at these here, these are the properties if you add the limits, you multiply the limits, or you divide the limits. All they're trying to say is you can split up. Let's say you do limit of x approach a number. f of x is the function divided by g of x. Then you can do the limit of the numerator and the limit of the denominator separately. If you're multiplying them, you got limit of f of x times g of x, you can separate that too and say, well, the limit of f of x multiplied to the limit of g of x. If you're doing a k, which is a constant multiplied to a function, you can take the k out and look at limit of f of x on its own. And then finally, the last uh, sort of sum and uh, sum and sum subtraction, yeah, or difference, sums and differences. Of functions, then you can also do them separately. That's all these properties are trying to say. Okay? Then your exercises, your aim is to make sure that if the limit, or in this case h, which is that parameter, if it approaches zero in this case, it could approach x could approach three, x could approach two. You're technically the technique all you're doing is you're saying what if it was equal to zero? What if it equals to three? What if it equals to two? How does it work? The only thing you gotta pay attention to is does it become undefined? Okay, where if it's undefined, you have to simplify. That's that's the only technique in exercise 9 now. Yeah, I'll go through some examples as well so you get your head around it. But if we were to do this one now, let's say this one. So if h approaches zero, three h plus four, we're just saying what if h was becoming a very very small number? Yeah, so a very very small number. Let's say it's not zero, but let's say it was one over. A trillion times three, or something like that, okay? What you know is, if you did three times something that's very, 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 very small, then what does the result become? Very, very small. Very, 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 very small, okay? So you're making it so small that it's almost negligible. That you're taking this very small number, and then you say, add four. Well, technically, you should be closest to four. It should be 4.00000 something. Does that make sense, what I'm trying to say? You're getting four, and you're adding on such a small number that you can say it's negligible. So hence it's just approaching four. It's not exactly four, but we're saying it's approaching four. That's what the limit is, is saying. It's saying if I kept going, what would approach, okay? Visually, let's say if I gave you y equals to one on x, for example, one on x looks like this. That's your rectangular hyperbola. If I said 
limit. So if I call this f of x, sorry. If I wrote this now, if I write, I'll write it in red so you can see. If I said limit, this is of f of x, and I said x approach zero, and I put a negative on that. So you see that negative equal there. That just means what if I approach zero on the left hand side? If I put a positive there, then it just means what if I approach zero on the right hand side? And in both cases, the answer is different. You see, looking at the graph, if I approach it from the left hand side, if I'm getting closer, if x is getting closer to zero, what is my y values tending to? A very large negative infinity, or small infinity. Negative infinity is where it's approaching. Because you can see, when x is here, y is here. Y is about that value. But if, as soon as I choose an x value closer to zero, the y value is getting very negative. The closer I get to zero, it's infinitely getting smaller. Okay? So that's what you can say in this answer here. What would you say if you write limit of x approach zero on the left hand side, then f of x will equal to. Infinity. That's how you write it. Okay, so if I gave you that example there, you can look at the graph and you say that would equal to negative infinity. Whereas if I then asked you a different question, I said, what about limit of x approach 0 from the positive side of f of x? Then in this case, your answer would be what? Positive infinity. Because you can see from the right hand side, if I approach 0, this is where 0 is. If I chose x here, you can see. The x, the y value, is a very, very large value. The closer I get to zero, the larger the y value is. So hence I would say positive infinity. Okay? So if you were answering this question A, this example A, you would say, well, if this is getting very small, then three times a very small number, can you, you can also say it's about zero. It's so small, you can call it zero. And therefore, zero plus four, you can say it's approaching four. Be about four. If you do the same for this question here, this is saying, well, what if x approaches 3? It's getting very close to 3. It's not exactly 3. But we're saying, all right, well, if that's the case, let's pretend it was 3. Then we're tending to 3 minus 2, which gives us 15 plus 2 over 1. And that gives us, it's approaching approximately 17. It's about there. It's not equal to that, but that's what limits is about. Limits is about observing what happens if I keep approaching Three. Okay, if I'm getting towards three. Now, in this case, they don't tell you it's positive from the left or from the right. In our case, we just assume it's approaching three. We just say two. Okay? Same thing with this one. So you're just saying two. You're putting in two here, that's eight times four, which is approaching 32. Now, the only time that you have to worry about, and I said it's when, whether it gets undefined or not. So if you have a look at this next example, that one. So why is this a problem? And that sometimes, this is more likely to come up in the exam than these three. These three is just your exercise books. Those ones are the ones you have to look at. So in this case here, it says, what happens when x approaches 3? Now if you follow that idea, you say, all right, well, it'll be about roughly, let's say it was close to 3, let's just call it 3. Then what you get is 0 in the denominator, and you get 9 minus 9. Is that 9? Yeah, it is. So 0 on 0. Right? But that becomes undefined. So that's a problem now. Yeah, most answers in your exams, what they'll do is they'll do zero, undefined, they have the correct answer as well. Okay? Zero and undefined as well. How do we do this problem? Very similar to first principles. When we first started exercise 9a, Marzen, what do you do? Factorize. Yeah. You factorize and simplify. That's the only way you can do this to sort of simplify it down and say, well, what about now? What if we eliminate that idea that it becomes undefined? What does it approach? Obviously, it's easier if you can sketch this graph. If you can sketch the graph, you can see it, and then you approach 3, and that's another way to see it. Okay. Otherwise, if you're just doing it algebraically at this point, you've got to simplify first before you find the limit. So in this case here, we're going to simplify by saying, all right, numerator, I've got the common factor there is x, so I'm going to take out x as my common factor x minus 3, that's divided by x minus 3. Notice my notation, if the limit is still there, you must write the limit. Don't ignore it. The only time you ignore the limit is when you use the limit, meaning you substitute 3 into it. That's the only time you ignore the next notation. So for example, now, I'm going to simplify. I'm going to say x minus 3 divided by x minus 3 is 1. 
So now I've got limit of x approach 3 for the function x. Now that I'm going to substitute 3 in, I'm going to say, all right, if it's approaching 3, then I don't write the limit anymore. But in your notation, when you're writing your layout, do not skip that. If you don't have that, that doesn't make sense. Okay, you don't have that in the final value right equals 3, where that comes from. Okay, so in terms of your layout, it's meant to start off with this question. You simply, you factorized it, you simplified it, now you approach. Okay, don't skip that limit of x approach. Okay, that, that's a common uh, notation that most students do wrong. Okay, so you have to have that layout. Does that make sense for 9L? Yeah, so all the examples that you're going to be doing in exercise 9L is just about, it's just about solving that, making sure it's not undefined, and then you can sort of solve for that. Easy? Okay. Now, continuity. You just need to know this definition for 9M. So that was 9L. 9M, continuity, a, a simple way of understanding what I've got on the right hand, top right hand corner there is the proper definition of what continuity is. So if your question in the exam asks you to prove if it's continuous at this point or not, the only way to show that is you're satisfying these two points here. Okay, so write that down as part of your notes that you need to know what do you need to satisfy. When they say show, this is how you show. Because the informal definition is, if you can draw the graph without lifting your pen, it's continuous. Okay, so if I draw this, that's continuous. If I drew a graph that was like this, that, that, and like this, that's not continuous. That's discontinuous. Okay? And we can prove that by doing these two points as a test. So theoretically, it's easy to understand. Continuous function is anything that you can draw without lifting your pen. Okay, you can even have this. You can have this graph up to here, it's open circle, and then you can have it closed circle here, goes here. You can go from here, another piecewise function, it could be like that. But if oh actually if that was open circle like this, this is not continuous. Okay, so yes, you can draw the shape all in one go, but you can't draw it without having this excluded. So this would be not continuous or discontinuous. To make it continuous, you can draw that in one go. You can literally go like this, like that, like that. So that means that all points exist. So that's continuous. So the informal definition for a continuous function just basically means can you draw a graph without lifting your pen. The formal definition is what I want you to copy because it's likely in the exam they're not going to say is this continuous? You say yes, you got one mark, they're not going to do that. They're going to say show that at x equals I don't know, 1 it is continuous. Okay. So prove whether this point at x equals you know, at coordinates 1, 3 is continuous. You have to show that it doesn't satisfy these two points Therefore, then you can say, therefore, it is not continuous. Okay? So, what are these two definitions? And it kind of makes sense as well. Both of these definitions make sense. Uh, if you think about it logically, the example I just gave you before, I said this point here, and it carries on. I said that's not continuous. You can prove it with these two points. The only way for it to be continuous is, number one, what is the same? If you have f of x, which is the curve, is defined means that there is actual y value to it number there when you put x in. What you can see here is if I put x at this point, there is no number. There is no y value. It's undefined. Therefore, it doesn't fit this point. Okay, so the first point is just saying that is there a number on the graph? Okay, so if you think about this one, if I gave you y equals 1 and x, it's clearly not continuous because at x equals 0, I don't have a number. That's why the graph of a rectangular hyperbola, you can tell there is no y value because there's an asymptote there. Okay, you can't draw that graph without lifting your pen off the paper. But by definition, f of 0 is not defined. Therefore, not continuous. That's how you, that's how you should be writing it. Okay, so if you can prove any of those two points that one doesn't exist, <coughs> Therefore, not continuous. Okay, so that's how you prove it. You've got to make sure those two points are satisfied to say, therefore, it is continuous. Okay, now, the first point makes sense. Does it exist? Does that point, on every single point on that curve, does it have a point? If it does, great. 
That's one satisfied. Second criteria. What does this mean? It says if you approach x, okay, if you approach x, uh, x approaches a certain number. What does this limit approach? And that's what exercise nine L was about. It was about what does it approach to? Does that equal to the same as the y value that it should be at that point? An example of this. When do you do this second test? I'll show you what I mean. This is an example when you have to use that point to prove that it's not continuous. <coughs> you might have a graph like this. I'll do it in blue so you can see. I can have a graph like this up to this point, and then it's and it exists from there. Let's say this is at one, actually two, and this is one. And let's say here was negative one. So at this point here, we're asking, is this graph continuous? Now logically, we all know, by informal definition, if I were to draw this graph, I have to draw it, lift off my pen, and continue to draw. So it's clearly not continuous. But you can't say that in exam. You can't say, I'm drawing the graph without lift off my pen, therefore it's continuous, yeah? Or discontinuous, you can't say that. So how do you prove it? See, if you go with the first point, it does exist. If you sub in negative one, you'll get two, because it, it exists there. So you do have a point. So the first criteria is ticked off. So how do you show that this is discontinuous? Is this second point. So the second point says, if I'm approaching from the left-hand side for the function at negative one, they'll give you the function, right? I can give you the function. But you can tell from the graph, it's approaching one. So the answer for this one is, it's approaching one. The y value. It's been one, 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 one up until this point. It's approaching one. Whereas over here, <coughs> f of a means if I sub negative one in, what do I get? Two. Therefore, these two, <coughs> they're not the same. If limit of f of x in this case here, if limit of x approach negative one of f of x, does that equal to f of negative one? In this case, it doesn't. Therefore, it is not continuous. Does that make sense why you need those two points for it to be continuous? So the informal definition for you guys to understand, you can draw the graph without looking at your uh, pen. So that's continuous. But how do you prove it? Those two points must be satisfied. So anytime you have a question that says show, prove, whatever it is, that's how you do it. Otherwise, you can't, you can't just say from the graph or whatever it is. You have to prove those two points. That's what they're looking for in there. Examiners. Okay. Any questions on those? <coughs> Say it again. Yep. Yep. To for it to be continuous, I'll show you one that is obvious that it is continuous. Let's say, um, yeah, or cubic. So you can choose this one here. If I chose, if I want to know, is it like existing at this point here? Let's say that was negative one. You can prove that this graph is continuous at this particular point, or this point is continuous by proving these two points here. When you sub in the value of negative one, yes, there is a y value. When you approach negative one from the left and right hand side, does it come to the same value? And okay, in this case here, yes, they do come to the same value. At this point, it's approaching y to zero. If you're approaching from the right, it's also approaching y to zero. Hence, at negative one, they're approaching. Zero. If I sub in negative one, does it equal zero? Yes, it does. Therefore, that point is continuous. Yes, Trent? Uh, log graph. Log graph. So this is my log graph. Okay. Then it depends on your domain now. So what if your uh, if you say log e of x, f of x, by definition of a log graph, for it to be a function to exist. Well, then yes, this is continuous because you can draw a graph one. In formal definition, you can draw it without letting go of your pen. But number two, where is it not continuous? You got to prove where it doesn't work. If you chose any x value, the implied domain right now is r plus. So if you chose any x value, they all have a y value. So that that's just not that point. Okay. Limit of f of x at the point doesn't matter which point you choose. As it comes from the left to the right, it's exactly the same. That's why every single point is inherently continuous on the log graph. But that's because the implied domain is R plus. But if the domain wasn't R plus, then you wouldn't have a function to begin with. So it goes back to chapter one again, what I said. What is a function? What does it mean? That's why 
everything, the, the examiners won't tell you those things and you have to be able to tell the examiners you know those things. That you know it's not a function. If the domain doesn't fit, then you say, what's well, not a function? And that happened last year actually in exam, it's the last question of last year's exam, exam one, last question. I'm pretty sure they got that one wrong. It wasn't a function, it doesn't work. But if you ignore it, then you get an answer. If you don't ignore it, you shouldn't get an answer. So I don't know how they marked that one last year. But I went through it and I had a look at it. The last question of last year's one that tripped a lot of students. You either stop at a point and say, it's not a function, and you prove that it's not a function, or you ignore that point and just keep going, and you get an answer. And a lot of students got tripped up around that point there. So it's a, it's a very good question from, uh, from last year. I'll find that when we get towards the end of the year. I'll show you that question again, and we'll revise our knowledge of what a function is. Yeah? All right. Any questions on continuity? We're pretty good? Yeah? Because we're now finally on to differentiability. <laughs> differentiability is the one that you'll probably need. Okay, so that's the only one that you'll answer. I just showed you what limits is. I just showed you what continuous is because for a function to be differentiable, it needed to be continuous. So if you didn't understand what continuous was and you didn't know how to prove it, then you can't prove something that's differentiable. Yeah? So that's why I was guiding you through how do you use limits, knowing how to use limits, and what differentiability means. Yeah? Now, differentiability, back then there were three points to solve. Now, they just tell you that point there, and it's continuous. There's only two things you've got to prove. This one makes sense from what we understand. As long as that point is continuous, okay, then, then that's satisfying one criteria. The next one that you have to satisfy to prove that this point is differentiable or not is the limit. And that's what I was trying to describe when I drew the modulus graph. I said limit from the left and limit from the right, it was different gradients. That's why it doesn't work. And that's, that's technically what this is saying. If you actually read it, f of a plus h minus f of a over h. Remember, this is just your first principles. First principle tells you your gradient. So all I'm saying here is, does the gradient from the left and right equal each other? Meaning, does it exist? If you have the same gradient, then of course, there is a gradient value. For example, the one I gave to you uh, just then, I started off with this graph. I said, what about this one? And we could see in our derivative graph that it was not the same. See, if I, wrote, if I tried to prove that using this point here, I'd say limit of x approach 0 for the modulus graph. So I did uh, modulus graph. Then you can already see that the f of x, which is the gradient, gradient's different. Because the gradient's different, you can already say it doesn't satisfy that first condition. The first condition is just saying it's only differentiable at a particular point if gradient on the left and the gradient on the right is the same. That's what this first line means. I know it looks hectic, but that's all it means. It just means gradient from the left, gradient from the right, at that particular point, are they the same? Because if they are, good. If they're not, then you don't have a gradient. Okay? So, that definition applies to even endpoints. So if you have a graph that looks like this, and it stops here, and that continues on, then it's differentiable at every single point all the way up until there. Why doesn't this one have a, a gradient or why is it not differentiable? There's a lot of ways to think about this. Logically, you can either prove it with this definition, gradient from the left and gradient from the right. It obviously doesn't exist. But logically as well, if I asked you to draw a tangent, you can draw a tangent at that point in almost any way. See, it doesn't make sense at that point. You can draw attention in all ways. You can have infinitely many different gradients across at that point. But by definition as well, from the limit from the left to the limit from the right, you don't have a gradient. It's not the same. On the right, there is none. On the left, it approaches a certain value. Therefore, it doesn't exist there for the gradient. Okay, so no endpoints in any derivative graphs and no sharp points. So no sharp points like the graph I showed you there. Any sharp points will not exist. Even if you get, you're given a graph that looks like this. If you have a graph that looks like, like that, it's continuous. All points are continuous. Not all points are differentiable. This is differentiable. This point is differentiable. This point is differentiable. This point is not differentiable. Because you can already see 
gradient of zero, positive gradient. So if you're coming from the left, at this point, it should be a zero gradient. But if you're coming from the right, it's coming towards whatever this gradient is currently at. That's positive gradient. So you can say, at this point, it should be undefined or not very much. This is a continuous graph. Then, the, yeah, the gradient graph is not, but the function itself is. Yeah, so you can get a, and that, that example there actually is this graph here. So you can sketch this one, and it will be, it can be continuous, but it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if the graph is continuous. It's just the question of, is it the same gradients at those two points? Yeah, so we're going to do this one. Let's say example 45. Let's do this one together. Let's have a look. Same thing, let's sketch the graph. You've got when x is greater than or equal to zero. So I'm going to draw the graph. This is where zero is. When it's greater than, I have a quadratic equation. Now I'm going to simplify this. This quadratic equation can be written as x plus 1 squared. Right? So that just means it moves to the left by 1. And it should look something, because it's not available there, the y-intercept is currently at 1 as well. So that's 1. So it should look something like that. Okay, so that's my quadratic graph, only from x greater than or equal to 0. When x is less than or equal to 0, I have a linear equation. This linear equation also has a y-intercept at this point. And it has an x-intercept at negative half. So there we go. This is my linear equation. I'll just draw this a bit more properly. Okay. Yep. Yep, but it's closed circle for the quadratic. So that's why I put it as that point is continuous. So this graph is continuous. Meaning you can draw this graph, every single point exists. So that's continuity. Every single point does exist, so it's continuous, but it doesn't mean every single point is differentiable. So how do you know if it's differentiable? You look at the gradient. See, this gradient here is a straight line. You can already tell gradient has to be 2. Gradient is 2, so that's a straight line with a gradient of 2 all the way. So every single point has a gradient of 2. Now if I were to draw the derivative graph, so I'll draw the derivative graph over here. I'll do it in green then it's meant to be a gradient of 2 all the way up to 0. At x equals 0, it goes up to 2, right? Whereas on the right-hand side, I've got a quadratic. And if I ask you to find the derivative of the quadratic, f dash of x, that gives you 2x plus 2. And we want to know what the gradient is at that point. So at x equals 2, zero, oh, you also get two. It should then be differentiable. Maybe it goes like, uh, like the gradient is the same when it moves on to the next. Like it's actually a straight line, it doesn't show the other kind Is it a straight line? The drawing down the tail. Oh, this is differentiable, is it? Yeah. I am confused. It is. <laughs> I didn't think it would be. Oh, the bell's just about to go. I'll confirm it. <laughs> you got to prove two points. So, as long as. Wait, let me just uh, go back. As long as you get these two points, you say it will be continuous in. That is defined. So, you find out if it's defined, you say yes. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah,
do you keep giving her? Yeah, you only give her. Okay. You only get two X. It shouldn't be X. Is if you were to do left hand side, like the f dash of x, you would get 2x plus 2, and this one would be 2. For x less than 0 and x greater than, and this is where we're trying to define does it equal to or not equal to at 0. Okay? So the only point we need to know do, do we have that? We don't know if we have that, and that's why we use our derivative graph. We say, all right, at limit x approach 0 for f dash of x, then that basically means for 2x plus 2, the limit approaches 2. And the right hand side, 2, there's no x value, so it's also equal to 2. So it is defined at that point. Thank you. 